do you think that the era of the ICO has passed, or do you think the era of the IPO has passed? Uh, no. <laughs> so, um, but there's more. There, there was regulated transparency around IPOs sure. in ways that well, there isn't. I mean, there is. There are rules in place already. Um, most businesses fail. Most startups fail. Um, most securities offerings are not sterling offerings. Um, some are fraudulent. So in the legacy world, we've been seeing this for a few hundred years, I think. Um, tokenization of all of this um, makes it all work better and faster. Um, there's still, in many cases, information asymmetries between those that know what's going on and, and naive consumers that get taken advantage of. Uh, the difference in in the blockchain space is that it's actually easier to stand up one of these projects, um, put it on the internet, uh, sell it to naive people in, in different countries. And that's, so China called a, a pause basically to ICOs. And they did that um, for a good reason. There were a lot of projects that were just copy and paste, pasted from other projects with um, the developers of those projects uh, having no uh, intention to deliver, uh, just take the money. Yeah, and there's and the, the Tezos example, which is they, they Tezos, raised yeah. Yeah, 232 million, I think, in their coin offering, and the yeah. future and governance of that is pretty unclear. It's a little ironic that uh, one of its features was better governance. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's a situation where you have uh, interpersonal issues between some leaders of the project, and that could happen in any project. The, the one amazing thing about having these projects on the blockchain out uh, uh, in a global context, uh, everything quite public, is that you have a lot of people scrutinizing these things pretty intensely. And so uh, if you do something wrong or dumb, um, it's going to come out pretty soon. Whereas uh, you know, in in history, we've had all these bucket shops where people are calling up old ladies and, and stealing their life savings, and uh, that's uh, it's a hard activity to police. So what but, is, what's, but, so what, yeah. um, there are laws in place. The SEC is uh, very aware of what's going on, and we at our company uh, do an enormous amount of legal work um, to ensure that we're um, either selling a tokenized security um, that is uh, registered or in conformance with exemptions or a token, a utility token that would not be perceived as a security. So my last question, so what is your biggest concern? What's the nightmare scenario that, that you worry most about in terms of Ethereum and blockchain technology? You have hacks. You have one of the, you know, one of the scenarios that was raised in the video around um, identity, transparency of identity and all of your transactions being exposed. You have the Chinese, uh, you know, vote basically in Bitcoin, especially via their mining, um, the mining that happens on their territory. Are these any of the scenarios you worry about or do you worry about other ones? No, I don't worry about any scenarios. Um, uh, it's not gonna be incredibly smooth, but the promise of this technology is so profound um, the legacy world is incredible, but profoundly broken. I mean, Equifax uh, <laughs> identity is, is completely broken. The financial system is moving towards bankruptcy. Um, so um, these technologies, or this technology is so powerful that uh, uh, it is inevitable that we will build better economic, social, and political systems on a, on a sounder, more trustworthy uh, foundation. You really don't worry about any scenario? Wow, amazing. It's the calm of the uh, ether billionaire. <laughs> so we're gonna, we're gonna take questions now. If you raise your hand, we have a, uh, a microphone. Uh,